Welcome to Arts in the City from the FDR Four Freedoms Park on Roosevelt Island. I'm Magalie Laguerre Wilkinson and we'll be showing you a little bit more of this gorgeous memorial to the nation's 32nd president throughout the show. But first, Tony Gaida introduces us to a photographer who's found beauty in the most unexpected and dilapidated places. Will Ellis looks through his camera lens and sees the past. Ellis is a photographer and urban explorer rummaging through New York's ruins to learn the tales they have to tell us. And this is the New York City farm colony. In the middle of Staten Island, remnants of a civilization that flourished 120 years ago and passed into history, a campus for the city's poor. So the idea was they, they worked the land in exchange for their room and board. It all pretty much looks like this. What it looks like is Dickensian. So these partitions would have been, what, rooms? Yeah, this is where uh, the residents would actually live. So you can see really close quarters. But it was either that or, you know, living on the streets. At the dawn of the last century, as many as 200 residents grew enough vegetables here to feed thousands. But as the country prospered, the poor found better jobs. Replacements for the farm's aging workforce became scarce. The farm colony was abandoned in 1975. This place, like more than any other, has become almost like a public space. The teenagers coming in here and doing graffiti, the paintballers out there building, you know, obstacles uh, for their games. So it's interesting to see what, what the public will do with the space when it's totally neglected and, you know, kind of left up yeah. to them to decide how to use it. Voices of another extinct population echo in this once abandoned railroad tunnel on Manhattan's Upper West Side. In the 1980s and 90s, this was the home of New York's mole people. There were hundreds of people living down here at the time. They had some pretty intricate living spaces. They had pets, some of them, uh, places to cook, uh, electrical hookups. Uh, so it wasn't a bad place to live at one point. A documentary was filmed about the mole people. There were countless television stories and at least two books, one by a journalist, another by an anthropologist. The mole people became celebrities. But when Amtrak resumed running trains here, the society of mole people ended. We're in a tunnel, but if we were standing here 80 years ago, we'd be at street level and there'd be no roof and it was actually called Death Avenue at one point because so many people would get killed just crossing the street, be struck by trains. To turn this slum into Mayfair, Robert Moses covered the train tracks, added tons of landfill, and created Riverside Park. Few visitors realize trains run below them in a tunnel that is famous as an iconic image of underground New York. This area was once called Barren Island. On a stretch of Brooklyn's shoreline lies an isolated area whose history Ellis calls ghoulish, with the ghastly name of Dead Horse Bay. There were horse rendering plants where the, the city's dead ho carriage horses would be sent to be turned into glue and fertilizer. That was in the 1850s. By 1900, this became a landfill accepting all of the city's garbage. The landfill was capped in 1953, but 60 years of tides have uncapped it, revealing in bones and bottles and all manner of debris the history of a grim period in New York. Will, you find beauty in decay. Yeah, I think it's, it's safe to say that. I think it has to do with this kind of, with death in a way how we're kind of simultaneously attracted to it and repulsed by it. Uh, and for some people, that just makes things uh, more interesting and uh, they can find beauty in that. Ellis has written a book about his explorations called Abandoned NYC. It contains dozens of his exceptional photographs, a timeless record of a city that is constantly changing. I think that's why it's important to you know, take a moment and take stock of what we have or what we're losing. You know, it's important to document these places and remember their stories. I'm Tony Gaida for Arts in the City. As superheroes and comic books continue to dominate international pop culture, our reporter Minnie Rowe discovered that the people penning these stories are just as diverse as their fans. In a world of superheroes, traditionally white and male like Captain America, Superman, and Batman, you'd be surprised to learn that the authors who breathe life into these characters are anything but.
These icons are as familiar to us as butter toast. Action figures capable of death-defying feats like shimmying up building walls or soaring through the sky. But what is not as widely known is that some of the authors penning these beloved characters have names like Hama, Chu, and Pak. They are Asian American, and they are helping to change the landscape of the industry from the inside out. The more diverse your writing staff gets, the, the more you know, interesting stuff you can do. Greg Bach is a freelance writer for publishing powerhouses like DC and Marvel Comics and has written The Incredible Hulk, Batman, and most recently, Superman, to name a few. I'm writing Superman. Superman's an immigrant. You know, he comes from planet Krypton. He doesn't belong. He's always struggling to kind of, and he's, 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 he's navigating multiple cultures and figuring out where, you know, what his role is. As a writer, Pak has the ability to incorporate diverse characters into his comics, like Wong in the Doctor Strange series, and Amadeus Cho, the Incredible Hulk's number one fan, a super genius who happens to be Korean-American. When I pitched the idea of doing this Korean-American kid, I never had that moment where people said, does he have to be Korean? Or, you know, that will happen in the film industry. Never, ever has had that ever happened in comics. He enjoys it. Thank you. And well, I'm glad to know that we have a comics author. With Amy Chu is a rising star in the comic book industry, a former Asian American activist turned businesswoman, turned comic book writer. She says she never dreamed this world was for her. But then it all changed after taking an online writing course. I produced what became my first published comic, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so I did the story and people liked it. And, and that's kind of a revelation for someone like me who's kind of done business or management all my life. After discovering a hidden passion, she went on to self-publish titles like Saving Abby and Girls Night Out, stories that would appeal to everyone, but particularly a female audience. Soon she found herself freelancing for established labels like Vertigo and DC Comics and writing about the adventures of the most recognizable female character, Wonder Woman. I do want to show there's diversity. When I write stories, I am acutely aware of ethnicity and uh, gender bias and things like that. So that definitely enters into the story. In the past, color simply referred to the hues that filled in the pages of a comic book. Then, a few decades ago, thanks to an ethnically diverse pool of writers and editors, a new breed of superheroes was born that no longer fit the mold. For example, take Cindy Moon, or Silk. She's an Asian American who developed superpowers after being bitten by a radioactive spider. Kamala Khan, AKA Miss Marvel, a Pakistani Muslim American from New Jersey. Turok is a Native American dinosaur hunter. There's Storm, the leader of the X-Men, who started life as the daughter of a Kenyan princess. People have created diverse characters in comics for decades, um, and uh, I think it's easier in comics because there are fewer people breathing down your neck. Pak and Chu say a lot of the credit of shattering the glass ceiling to the formerly white male-dominated world of comic book writing goes to Larry Hama, a Japanese-American author with a cult-like following for his work on G.I. Joe. In the comics world, Larry Hama is one of those people who, you know, from the beginning was getting in there and, you know, in places where somebody like him had not traditionally been and, uh, and making it all work. When he introduces female characters or Asian characters, these are real characters that everyone loves. And it's not like, okay, I'm gonna wave a flag in your face. I'm gonna put an Asian American character in there and there you go. He does it so seamlessly, people don't even know they've been co-opted into a progressive kind of agenda. It's wonderful. Chu says, personally, she tries to stay away from creating characters just for the sake of diversity. But she admits she does feel a sense of responsibility to be a watchdog for her industry from behind the scenes. Now it's kind of embedded in that, like, oh my God, I just read the worst comic where I'm like, I'm looking at the Chinatown, the sky drew, and it's like paper lanterns in the streets. I'm like, 
this is a community, dude, you know? And I'm not going to be out there, like, pounding my fist. In, but I want every reader to know that that's not, even if it's a fantasy, it's a racist fantasy, you know? And let's, let's, let's change that by me being in the industry, other people being in the industry. At the end of the day, these writers say they just want to create a world. Yes, even a fantasy one that is a mirror image of the world in which we all live. And the world in which we live is more and more diverse every day. And, you know, putting that lived experience in the books is, uh, is what we should be doing. That's what's, what makes them live and breathe and makes people care. So hope I can keep doing that. I'm Minnie Rowe for Arts in the City. I'm Pat Collins on Broadway. The British have invaded again, bringing us the theatrical event of the season, Wolf Hall Parts 1 and 2. The plays are based on Hilary Mantel's best-selling novels about Thomas Cromwell, Henry VIII's crafty, ambitious, and ruthless right-hand man. Six years ago in Parliament, you said I could not afford a war. Wars are not affordable things. No prince ever says to himself, uh, this is my budget, so this is the kind of war I can have. He came from very humble, a very humble background. He was a complete nobody. And he disappeared to Europe when he was young and came back to England a soldier, a mathematician, an astrologer, a banker. Uh, what he didn't know was not worth knowing. Uh, so he became very useful to very powerful people in England and just slowly, slowly climbed his way up the ranks until he met Henry VIII and became Henry VIII's um, fixer. Cromwell is an anti-hero. He's a, he's, a, he's a man for our times, really, because his motivations are really opaque. You can't quite work him out. He's very enigmatic. So for that, that feels much more like The Sopranos or House of Cards. Exactly. Cromwell made himself indispensable to his king, best known for disposing of unwanted wives, the break with the Catholic Church, and a large appetite. Henry VIII usually, I think, is depicted as a sort of chicken bone sucking, thigh slapping, wench grabbing, big fat guy. All sauce and no substance. This guy has subtlety, he, I hope, uh, wit, I hope, um, vanity, uh, vulnerability. It's something we never normally get to see in Henry. Uh, Henry VIII, particularly, this dangerous, charismatic man, always in search of the right woman. He was a man who wants a child, he wants a son. It's such a, a heartbreaking human situation. And yet, he takes like, such cost from the people around him. Every lord, every landed gentleman, every lackey can get boys, only the king can't seem to manage it. He needs a son born in wedlock, an heir to sit on his throne when he's gone. Cromwell's mentor, the immensely influential Cardinal Wolsey, could not convince the Catholic Church to annul Henry's first marriage to Catherine of Aragon. Henry acquired six wives. He divorced two, beheaded two. One who lost her head was Anne Boleyn. I don't think any of the accusations made against her in the play, in the book, and in history were true, but I'm a little biased. I think any woman who can say no to the King of England for six years, which is what she had to do to, to secure the annulment from Catherine, is hardly going to jump into bed with all of his friends on, you know. So I don't think she was, you know, I think she had a much slicker political cunning mind. Tell him, Cromwell. I... I wish it made clear to your master and to all Europe that a bill is going through Parliament which settles the succession of England on my children. Mine, and not Catherine's. 
Future Queen Jane Seymour, played by Leah Brotherhead, was an observant lady-in-waiting. She has seen how things have gone down with the other ladies, and I think Hillary's interpretation of Jane is fascinating, and the idea that actually she has got, you know, a good head on her shoulders, and she's <laughs> able to see... Which yes, is... Which, well, yes, I, I which, is <laughs> which is a major... <laughs> yeah, which is a major... <laughs> with, with uh, <laughs> um, so, yeah, she's a really fun character to play. The Tudors are ubiquitous on both sides of the Atlantic. Before Wolf Hall arrived on Broadway, the two plays were hugely successful in London. A six-part BBC series which stars Mark Rylance as Cromwell and Homeland's Damien Lewis as Henry was a ratings triumph in the UK. You'll not find any talent I possess that England cannot use. That miniseries recently made its American debut on PBS's Masterpiece. And Miss Mantell won the Man Booker Prize for both Wolf Hall and its sequel, Bring Up the Bodies. Why did you decide to make Cromwell the centerpiece? He was a blacksmith's son. How did he attain such power at the king's right hand? What kind of a man could do that? Or what kind of a man was prepared to gamble with such high stakes? The stakes are your life, and it's on the line every day. He's a superb politician. He's a superb politician. This is one of the great draws of the play, is that it's a great study of politics. You see him in, in every area of society in the shows. He's talking to kings and ambassadors one minute, then he's in a backroom bar the next minute, threatening to beat somebody up. There have been more than 30 movies and TV series about the Tudors. Lucy Briars, who plays Catherine of Aragon, explained our fascination with those royals from so many centuries ago. Perhaps because America is a newer country, it, perhaps it's that, and they were a very dramatic period of time in a very dramatic family, a bit like the Borgias, you know, <laughs> that kind of feeling. Very extreme, I think. Yeah. High-end soap opera. Absolutely. It is. It is. <laughs> That's what these are. All I ask for is a country godly and quietly governed, and a little peace and quiet for myself. Wolf Hall is one of four shows nominated for Best Play at the Tony Awards, taking place next month. I'm Donna Hanover. It turns out one of the most memorable romances in modern history may have involved treason. King Edward VIII of Britain is most famous for abdicating in 1936 after less than a year on the throne to, as he said, marry the woman I love. They became the Duke and Duchess of Windsor. Well-known royal watcher Andrew Morton says Edward was besotted with Wallace Simpson, a twice-divorced American from Baltimore. She's witty, and you can see that she's, that she's very intriguing. And, and quite frankly, sexually, I think they had a bit of a Fifty Shades of Grey relationship in so far as she wore the trousers and he did her bidding. But Morton says in his new book, Seventeen Carnations, there was an even bigger scandal. Here we have a man who was infatuated not just with Wallace, but with Hitler. Morton first came to public attention for his book in 1992, Diana, Her True Story, which turned out to be based on audio tapes the princess recorded for him. He has now turned to the Windsors. The title of your book is 17 Carnations. What does that refer to? During the 30s, um, Hitler sent a, a man called Joachim von Ribbentrop over to London to kind of soften up British public opinion. He was a diplomat. And I think he did more than soften public opinion up. He apparently had an affair with Wallace Simpson, and he gave her a bouquet of 17 carnations, the number of seven, 17 representing the number of occasions they'd had sex together. So this is a story that went round the diplomatic circles like wildfire. Morton says Scotland Yard worried that Wallace might be a spy for the Nazis. And after Edward abdicated, the Windsors actually went to visit Hitler. In October 1937, they accepted Hitler's invitation to spend uh, 12 days touring Germany. Edward and Wallace Simpson were treated as if they were royalty, where people bowed and curtsied to Wallace, called her, royal, her your royal highness. Edward and Hitler had a meeting for 50 minutes in his mountain retreat. Morton writes that in 1940, once the war against Britain was underway, Hitler and his spymaster even planned to kidnap the Duke and Duchess while they were in Portugal. They tried to entice them with hunting trips, uh, with scare stories that the British were going to kill them. Remember, at the time, the Duke of Windsor was very agitated. He, he and Churchill had fallen out badly. 
Churchill had threatened him with a court-martial if he didn't obey orders. So they were ripe fruit for the picking by the Nazis. Your theory is that Hitler wanted to, once he took over Britain, install Edward as a puppet king. It's only a question of time. Uh, they would have probably succeeded. But as it was, they boarded their ship to the Bahamas on August the 1st, sailed off into the sunset, and Churchill let out a huge sigh of relief. Morton says letters and Nazi records on the Duke and Duchess were discovered after the war and called the Windsor file. It was found in a metal canister in uh, a German estate. It was a file of what the Duke of Windsor was saying during his stay in Spain and uh, Portugal in 1940. And what he was saying was treacherous, possibly treasonous. He was talking about the need for heavy bombing of Britain. He was talking about how he'd contacted the Germans to ask them to look after his rented properties in Paris and in the south of France. He was talking um, uh, about the king as being stupid, very stupid. He was talking about the queen as being conniving. He was being just disloyal. Remember, he was a major general in the army. He was contacting the Germans to look after his property. So Churchill, Attlee, the Prime Minister, Bevin, the Foreign Secretary, together with Dwight Eisenhower, who was then Supreme Allied Commander, worked together to remove this file from the face of history. For years, the establishment in Britain and in America denied, denied, denied the truth of what is in this book. The Windsor file did come out in 1957, 12 years after the end of the war. Queen Elizabeth was then on the throne, and by then, the Duke of Windsor was very much a marginal figure. He was a character, almost like a cartoon character. He just went from the south of France to Palm Beach to New York, gambling tables. He was a playboy prince. He was a figure of no consequence. In the long game, many historians think that Wallace Simpson did Britain a big favour by having Edward abdicate, because otherwise he, we would have had a pro-Nazi king on the throne at, at the most perilous time in Britain's history. The royal family never fully let the Duke and Duchess of Windsor back into their lives. The couple spent their remaining days at their home in Paris. Who can ever forget that dress? Icelandic singer-songwriter Björk is known internationally for her Grammy Award-winning music, her striking music videos, and her bold fashion statements. Now she's trying to conquer a new medium, fine art. I'm Andrew Falzone. When it comes to the Museum of Modern Art, music may not be the first thing that comes to mind, but international recording star Björk is helping visitors realize that modern art and music go hand in hand. And now the audio-visual art created by Icelandic recording artist Björk is part of a MoMA retrospective highlighting her career. Her solo work began in 1993, and some of the sheet music from her better-known songs is on display, complete with handwritten notes. Fans of the artist will revel in the presence of paraphernalia that includes handwritten lyrics and personal diaries and some of the artist's iconic attire. To keep music at the forefront, the centerpiece of the exhibit is an audio-visual composition commissioned exclusively for the show. The composition entitled Black Lake goes beyond being an exhibition of music. The video is displayed in a room with identically sized screens on opposite ends. The room was remodeled with felt outcroppings to mimic the Icelandic cave where the video was shot. Among the larger items on display are the gravity harps that Bjork used on her Biophilia tour, which began in 2011. The giant pendulum swing back and forth in the MoMA exhibition hall, producing individual musical notes. While the exhibit as a whole has drawn criticism online for only providing a cursory retrospective of the artist's ongoing career, those who are otherwise unfamiliar with her work might come to a better understanding and appreciation of the impact she's had on today's mainstream artists. The Bjork Retrospective runs at the Museum of Modern Art until June 7, 2015. I'm Andrew Falzone for Arts in the City.
happen to be looking for a new idea in dinner entertainment, prepare to be amazed. Here's Barry Mitchell. Barry Mitchell on 9th Avenue and 49th Street. Looks like Gossip Restaurant is up to its old tricks. Taste of Magic is New York City's only close-up magic show. We're a New York City's only close-up dinner theater magic show, and we take place exclusively in and around New York City in fabulous restaurants all around. We have anywhere between seven and ten performers at every single show, because each and every table gets its own magician in between each and every course. Taking the coin, putting it in there, and make it vanish completely. Wow. Our show is appropriate for all ages. We get really little kids and families all the way up to date nights, we are the Benihana of magic. It happens right there in front of you. Maybe five or six designs and cycle through. So some of those were neat, but all of the fronts of the cards are different. What's more difficult, stage magic or close-up magic? And how are they different? I would say, off the top of my head, I would have to say that close-up magic is probably more difficult. I mean, they both require a great deal uh, of skill, but close-up magic is you're being burned. The eyes are, are, are two inches away as opposed to however many rows of seats in the theater back. There's an urge to perform. There's an urge to astonish people and amaze people. And I think for most of the other people involved with this group, it's a, it's a burning passion. And like everybody else, I work very hard at it. My name is Rachel. I'm going to be your only lady magician for the evening, so you should all look a lot more excited than you do now. I'm actually a fashion design student at FIT. But this has become a hobby for me and become even more of a job since I've met these guys, since being able to perform at A Taste of Magic. I actually got into magic because of my dad. He is a doctor, but he's always done magic as a hobby. And one time he taught me how to do a magic trick, and I thought it was the coolest thing ever. Go ahead, flip those over. Show the whole table. Oh, my God. That's amazing. Great. Right, you know, there are some people who are technically really, really good, but if you can't captivate people and you can't capture their attention, then it's a moot point. Before Magic, you did what? Uh, well, I was a three-time All-American wrestler at the University of Maryland. I uh, spent the last few years as a wrestling coach at Columbia, but I'm um, here tonight uh, to follow kind of my passion in Magic, uh, another big part of my life. Tell me about your, you have a foundation? Yeah, so I run, I'm the executive director of an organization called Athlete Ally. Uh, so we work to end homophobia and transphobia in sports, so that takes me all over the country working with professional athletes, college, high school, uh, really educating um, those communities on how they can create a more welcoming and respectful culture. Now you're going to give me half the deck and you're going to keep half the deck. This is called Do As I Do. How has magic helped you in your crusade? Well, uh, I would say it's a great icebreaker. You know, I oftentimes am engaging in a very um, tense conversation. Some, sometimes it's been the first time that an athlete has ever thought about or talked about LGBT issues. So magic can be a great way to pique their interest and hopefully, um, you know, make it a little bit... Uh, just a, a, a lighter environment. The smartest people enjoy magic. Scientists and judges and doctors, all, all of these people have been my clients and they enjoy magic the most. They're the ones who enjoy letting go of their knowledge, even for a moment. They just want to be delighted and surprised. Absolutely. A Taste of Magic. For more information, visit atasteofmagicnyc.com. Coming soon to a restaurant near you. Barry Mitchell for Arts in the City. Ta-da! That's our show for today. For more information on any of our stories or to watch them at any time, go to cuny.tv. I'm Magalie Laguerre-Wilkinson, and I'll see you next month on Arts in the City.